I was really pleased to uh, be invited here to speak with you this evening, uh, as few things have been more important in my life than, first of all, the nurturing and joy that, uh, that this community has given me for over 70 years, and secondly, learning, um, particularly the more formal sense of learning and schooling and public education, and I'm going to speak about the value of public education as part of my remarks tonight. Local Voices is a uh, wonderful partnership between the Historical Society and the Memorial Library, um, and I'm a very big fan of this particular library. But as my gray hair suggests, uh, I represent the history uh, component of tonight's program. When uh, Maya and I met last week, she spoke about her exciting educational opportunities that she's receiving at the Pacific Science Enterprise Center, which I always knew as the Great Northern Canary. And there's a photograph of the Great Northern Cannery, which was uh, owned and operated by the Millard family. Uh, it played a very significant role in the life of the community when I was growing up. I'm going to break from my script for a minute to introduce uh, a, a longtime member of the, uh, the Millard family and a very close friend for days going back into high school. Don Millard, maybe Don, you could stand up. Don is... Uh, Again, a, a great community member, someone who has um, very been very loyal to the history of this community. And Don, you will enjoy this little story that I'm going to tell. Um, <laughs> and by the way, this won't be the last time you'll see Don on the screen. <laughs> He's not in that picture, but he'll be in another one. Um, when I was uh, first uh, appointed to uh, the school district, I had been in Vancouver for uh, 24 years and then came to West Vancouver and I was working in curriculum and uh, we were interested in helping our newly appointed teachers, particularly those who were new to West Vancouver, who'd come from somewhere else, to um, better understand the history of the community. And uh, so I arranged for uh, the Museum and Archives, uh, the Gertrude Lawson House, many of you know that, um, to host an event for our elementary teachers to show the learning resources that might be available that they could take back to their classroom. And uh, we were uh, uh, sitting in a round circle, about a dozen of us, and uh, the archivist was showing us some interesting resources, lots of photographs, and he held up a photograph of the, uh, of the cannery, uh, which of course was no longer operating, and mentioned that there was a cannery on the site, the, the Great Northern Cannery. And... Um, Don had, at one point during our high school days, asked if a few of us from school could help during a, a particularly rush period at the cannery, and I worked there for about 10 or 12 days. That's the extent of my cannery experience at Great Northern. But I happened to mention to the, uh, all the teachers, I said, well, this is a really important uh, piece of our history, and, and you should know that I actually worked at this cannery. And one of the teachers, um, who was obviously quite cheeky, said, um, oh dear, uh, these learning resources that you're showing us are very interesting, but we actually don't really need them. We have our own um, very special live artifact in our superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura urged us to uh, tell our own personal story of learning, and to do that I thought I'd begin by reflecting on some of the history of this community as I have known it as a child and as a student. So let me introduce you to my parents. Uh, pictured here on their wedding day, May 13th, 1942. Married at a, a church in East Vancouver. Uh, Mom and Dad were both born uh, in East Vancouver and they grew up during the Depression. Mom went to Templeton Secondary School. At that time it was a junior secondary school. And Dad went to Vancouver Technical, which was up until the war, a school only for boys with a focus on technical training. But, you know, in both cases, uh, the Depression and hard times uh, forced both of them to leave school before graduation. They met uh, on the, uh, and some of you will remember uh, stories of this, the Hastings streetcar um, while working at the Woodward store downtown. And then the war uh, broke out and Dad listed almost immediately. Uh, he often told me that his best learning came during the four years that he served in the RCAF. When the war ended, um, they, like all new parents, were searching for a better life and a better opportunity for their children. And they found it in West Vancouver. Um, at that time, still viewed by many in the city as rural, isolated, uh, as the British uh, sometimes say, the back and beyond, um, but where land was very inexpensive. 
Uh, they settled here uh, in the late 1940s and they built a, a very modest home on Evelyn Drive just as the construction of Park Royal was getting underway. And uh, you can't quite see our house, but um, if you compare uh, Evelyn Drive then to Evelyn Drive today, um, you'll notice the difference. So West Vancouver was, uh, I think you'll all know, very different then. Uh, it was a place that was, uh, I guess, barely middle class, uh, where the schools were all public, uh, where this library at that time was still just an idea to memorialize those who had died in the war, and without a swimming pool, without a nice arena, without a community center, or without a country club. But my parents would have told you that it was a great place to raise a family. It was an opportunity, a community where everyone seemed to know everyone, and where your neighbors were school teachers, bus drivers, business people, and nurses. Most were of British origin, and so on Victoria Day, we celebrated the Queen's birthday with a parade and the crowning of our May Queen. The British traditions of maypole dancing and curly wigs and robes for the page boys who accompanied the May Queen were all designed to add a sense of formality to the celebration. Now who can tell me who the page boys are? <laughs> ah, there's one. I can. <laughs> and here's the other. <laughs> oh no! I saw his picture. So, Don, I think it, we, we haven't been to each other. No. We didn't know each other until high school. But this went back to elementary. It did. So, what elementary school you were at? West Bay, were you? West Bay. Right. And I was at Pauline Johnson. And I think two boys were selected to be page boys to accompany the, the May Queen, who was a, a senior high school student. And uh, it was one of the hottest days of the year under those wigs, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so it's very special for me to have Don here tonight. Uh, it was a community where residents uh, largely shared the same values and where the authority to uh, promote these values was transferred to others in the town. People such as shopkeepers, firemen, police officers, many of whom lived in West Vancouver. For kids, it seemed to us that there was almost a conspiracy amongst everyone in the community to make sure that we didn't get into trouble. But even then, it had very good schools. I began my formal education at Pauline Johnson in 1954 in the grade one class of Miss Winifred Boom, my first crush. She of the perfect Maclean's penmanship. Some of you will remember that. Miss Boom uh, was adorable, and she was the first of many dedicated teachers who, along with my parents, gave me skills that lasted a lifetime. I knew even then, as I said to Laura, I wanted to be a teacher. By the time I uh, graduated from West Van High in the uh, 1960s with Don, uh, West Vancouver had become increasingly more prosperous, and many of my peers had achieved uh, considerable success both in the classroom and on the playing field. Uh, this photo of the 1966 graduation banquet at the Hotel Vancouver shows the size of our class, among the largest ever at that school, but it can't capture the remarkable academic success that so many of my classmates have achieved. Uh, Barbara's here tonight uh, from that same graduation banquet, and uh, many of us uh, stay in touch and uh, have enjoyed a, a wonderful life of good health and, and success due in large part to our families and our public education system. And, you know, a track and field was uh, also a very big cultural event in the community at that time. This uh, slide from our school annual uh, shows that uh, West Van wins again. I think it was five consecutive years that West Vancouver had the most outstanding track and field team in the Lower Mainland, and Empire Stadium was filled with students enjoying the competition. <laughs> Um, and West Van was a big part of that culture. I graduated from UBC in the early 70s and began teaching at Vancouver Tech and at Templeton, a career choice that, um, and first assignment that I'm sure left my poor father a bit puzzled. Uh, he'd always hoped that I would follow him into the business world, and he never imagined that I would return to his roots in East Vancouver. I recall my first few years of teaching vividly. I loved teaching and worked alongside some of the most uh, caring and dedicated staff you could ever hope to meet. 
In many ways, those first few years of teaching shaped my thinking about what matters most in education. I firmly believe it's not the curriculum or the learning resources or even a brand new school building. Rather, I think as any student can tell you, learning thrives best when creative, skilled, and committed teachers care deeply about their students. Well, I thrived on the relationships that I was able to develop with my students, particularly those who were vulnerable or a bit marginalized. And that was where, for me, my real learning began. I was still quite young, and having grown up in what was, for the most part, a stable, homogeneous, middle-class community, I knew little about students from other cultures, those who faced challenges in their learning, or those whose home life was much less predictable than mine had been. The struggles faced by refugees' children, by students living in poverty, or by indigenous teens who had faced years of racism and injustice were still really largely unknown to me. But I didn't recognize the inequity between the opportunities that were available to me in West Vancouver and those facing students growing up not far from what was to become one of Canada's poorest postal zones. And this was the 60s and the 70s, remember that, the early days of civil rights and the movement towards greater social justice. I think it's fair to say uh, that there was a spirit of idealism amongst uh, many of the colleagues that came into teaching with me at that time. We wanted to change the world, and we wanted to do it through education. And I do believe that this was a generation of educators that should take some pride in the strategies and programs that resulted from their advocacy, particularly the inner city school movement. And so for me began a long, lifelong commitment to public education, for in my mind, public schools are in fact our best chance to give all of our children an equal chance to avoid what I would call the tragedy of a class-based society. Years later, uh, I became president of the BC School Superintendents Association, and I had the opportunity to welcome uh, almost 600 educators from around the world to an international conference here in Vancouver. And in my remarks that morning, I introduced ourselves by suggesting that Canadians are by nature somewhat quiet and humble people. But we take great pride in the beauty of our natural environment, in our efforts to find social justice and peace, and in the richness of our cultural diversity. I made it clear, however, that nothing brings a greater sense of pride to Canadian educators than does our system of public education, a system that for many is the envy of the world. And I suggested that there's a deep sense of belief among us that a strong and vibrant public education system is at the heart of what we stand for as a country, and indeed its success, or lack of, will define the future of this nation. That public schools are the institutions that Canadians rely on to bind us together as a country, where our values, beliefs, and traditions are formed. And it is, in fact, the universality of a high-quality public education system that has made Canada such a remarkable success story, that our prosperity has been built to a great extent through public education. Well, our schools are not perfect. But inner city schools uh, across this province, children now no longer go hungry every, every morning. Specialized staff are in place to assist refugee families with their adjustment to a new language, a new culture. And children learn in classrooms supported by a wide variety of support services. Psychologists, speech language pathologists, and teacher librarians, one of whom is here tonight. In West Vancouver, Children come from all over the Lower Mainland, and indeed from all over the world, to attend our public schools. And you know, as you grow older, it's natural to look back, sometimes with nostalgia, which can be a dangerous thing, about the good old days, we might call them. And you heard me say earlier how privileged I was to grow up here, when times were simpler, when the houses were modest, when your front door could be left unlocked, and when nobody argued about a new bus service. As your superintendent, uh, I often heard parents and, young, and grandparents yearn for a more traditional approach to learning, one that probably served them so well. So in closing, I'd like to uh, take us back to my primary school days at Pauline Johnson. How barren that playground looked in 1954. If you've been up to Pauline Johnson recently and seen the beautiful and enriching uh, outdoor learning grounds in Community Park, that exists today, uh, there is simply no comparison. If you haven't been there, you must go see it. Well, what was learning like for us? 
This is the photograph of my grade 2 class, all 28 of us. Perhaps some of you might even recognize, I imagine Barb can recognize, and Don perhaps too, a few of those young children. Sadly, I have misplaced the photo of my grade 1 class and Miss Boom. I couldn't find my class photo from kindergarten because, of course, we didn't have kindergarten in 1953. Today, I'm pleased to say every child in this province gets a much earlier start on learning. Literacy in the 1950s meant trying to find Dick, Jane, and Spot somewhere on the page and desperately trying to avoid relegation to the Bluebird reading group. I don't have to tell you what primary children are doing in today's bright, interactive digital classrooms. Classrooms that are, uh, in every case, much smaller than this one. As research has made it clear that smaller classes in the primary grades do significantly improve learning. And as you look at this photo, think about who was not there. First of all, my indigenous peers, whose ancestors, I'm told, had hunted deer on the grounds of this school, were attending a segregated school in North Vancouver. And while I learned nothing truthful about the experience of indigenous people in this country, Children today do learn from a new curriculum in schools where the history and cultural traditions of the Squamish nation are valued and appreciated. Also missing were children with special needs. Inclusion of special needs children was a dream of parents yet to be fought. And in most districts, yellow buses arrived early in the morning to take these children to a segregated setting in a special school. And I have no doubt some of the children in this photograph might have struggled with learning with reading, with literacy. But learning assistance as we know it today was a shadow of our present day service and the term learning disability was not even yet invented. I'm sure that our teachers knew that some of these students were not learning, they just didn't know why. However, I imagine uh, the very first thing you noticed in this class picture was the lack of cultural diversity. And while teaching a homogeneous English language speaking class may have some advantages, it does little to prepare our children for the world. As superintendent, I was often asked to uh, speak briefly to graduates of their banquet, and I would use that opportunity to wish them well as they set out in the world, commenting that they were very unlikely to follow my path across the Pauline Johnson playground to the school board office. Instead, in a global economy, they may well end up living in Berlin, Milan, or Hong Kong, just as three of my adult, five adult children do today. And finally, in preparing uh, for this talk, I asked the current school superintendent, Chris Kennedy, to suggest uh, some of the things he would wish to celebrate about public education in the community today. In addition to the changes that I already mentioned, Chris drew up a list that included a number of things. First of all, he commented on the large number of women today in leadership roles. Today in West Vancouver, the majority of senior leaders in schools and in the school district office are women. When I started teaching in the early 70s, um, there were 62 principals and vice principals in the 18 high schools in Vancouver. All 62 were men. Uh, the breakthrough uh, administrator was a woman named Catherine Strike, a West Vancouver resident, and she became the first female secondary vice principal at a time when people didn't believe that women could do that work. Now they lead the system. Also on the list uh, of Chris's um, uh, great um, sense of pride is the outstanding graduation rates of our students. 98% uh, of the students in West Vancouver uh, graduate from school and that continues to be the highest in the province. Chris spoke of the uh, remarkable appetite uh, uh, for learning, a message echoed by uh, this library's head of youth services, Shannon Azerni. Uh, they both marvel at the many students who are taking courses in the day, at night, in the summer, online, 12 months a year. Learning is everywhere. Chris is uh, particularly proud of the success of the district's academy programs where students have a chance to follow their passion for ice hockey, animation, ballet, environmental science, as we'll hear later, and more than a dozen other programs as part of their academic cycle. These photos display, this photo displays the work of students in the wildly popular Robotics Academy. And finally, um, the enriching opportunities for travel that are available in today's students. From humanitarian trips to Central America, as shown here, 
to an upcoming expedition to Antarctica next month by 18 students from Sentinel Secondary School. Our kids are now everywhere around the globe. So I could say uh, more about the wonderful learning that's taking place today, both inside our schools and out in the community. But the library uh, and Laura were very wise in selecting Maya to tell you the truth about all this, the complete story of why learning is so much more engaging today than it was when I went to school, and I'll let her do that. Thank you so much for coming and for listening.